you're going to need, if you're in district one, you're going to need six votes to win. So uh, voter A has a lot less power than voter B. Therefore, this map is illegal. This map, map violates rule number one, which is one person, one vote. Each person's vote needs to have the same weight. So we can't have 40,000 people in one district and 100,000 people in a different district because the people in the 40,000 member district, 40,000 resident district have more political power per person than the people who live in a district with 100,000 people. So one person, one vote means every district needs to have the same number of residents, not the same geographical size, not the same number of voters. That's a little tricky but the same total population and population is defined in this for this purpose as people who sleep there. We'll come back and talk some more about some complications about that. So that's rule number one, got it. One person, one vote, rule one. All right, rule two. Rule number two, no discrimination on the basis of race. This comes from the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, the most important part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, most people will say is section two. Um, section two says that no voting laws or practices can discriminate against racial or language minorities. So um, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. In um, the early 80s, Congress clarified that what they mean by discrimination is that it can't have the effect. You can't have any voting practice that has the effect of disenfranchising minorities. Even if you didn't mean for it to have that effect, uh, it doesn't matter what you say you were trying to do. If that's the effect, then it's discrimination and it's banned under section two of the Voting Rights Act. Um, 1986, there was a Supreme Court case called Thornburg versus Gingles. And in that case, uh, that was a unanimous Supreme Court decision um, against the North Carolina state legislature. So the state legislature had drawn maps that were gerrymandered to disenfranchise um, the black population. Uh, and they said, no, 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 we did the best that we could. And the Supreme Court uh, said it's not good enough. And they laid out something called the Gingles test. So the Gingles test is how you decide whether you could do better. So you need, it's basically like, when do you have to create a majority minority district? If you meet the criteria for the Gingles test, then you must create one or more, maybe dozens of majority minority districts. So we can talk more about that if we need to later, but it gives you a direction to go if you wanna Google more. Um, then the second important part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is section five. Section five says certain states and localities have a history of discrimination in voting practices. And so those certain states and localities have to go through a preclearance process and any changes they make to voting practices or to maps have to be reviewed by the Federal Department of Justice before they can go into effect to ensure that those practices and maps are not uh, improper uh, and discriminatory. So this was in place from 1965 uh, all the way up until 2013. And in 2013, Shelby County, Alabama sued and successfully brought down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. They didn't totally bring down Section 5, let me be clear. Section five says certain states and localities. That remains true, but the list of states and localities is what Shelby County questioned. And Shelby County won that lawsuit in a 5-4 Supreme Court decision. And so the list of states and localities was thrown out and, and the Supreme Court told Congress that they need to create a new list based on newer data, data newer than 1965, about which states and localities should have to go through preclearance. Congress has not done that. They have not created a list of states and localities that have to go through preclearance. So no one has to go through preclearance. So this year, 
this year was the first time that we have done redistricting since the Shelby decision came down. This will be the first time since 1965 that Alabama has been able to change its rules, change its maps without any federal oversight. Quake in your boots a little bit. You should be quaking a little bit. It's a little scary. Okay. All right. Hey, no barking dogs. All right, so um, those are the only two rules. You got them, right? One, one person, one vote. And two, oh dear, which is mostly about section two of the Voting Rights Act. One second. Hey, cut it out. So sorry. How dare our neighbors move on? So in addition to those two rules, those are the only ones that are rules. In addition to those two rules, we have some guidelines. So the Alabama State Legislature has put forward guidelines for redistricting, and these are them. So um, paraphrased to fit on a slide, I should say. So the first guideline that they have, and these are in priority, priority order, the first guideline is you have to minimize population deviations, which is the same thing as rule number, what, who knows? Yes, Sonia? Sonia, you've got your hand raised. Did you mean to raise it? Yes. Why does why hasn't Congress made that new new list? Oh, it's political. Okay. I mean, yeah, I'm sure it would just be really hard to get passed. Um, okay. Yeah. So so. The top priority here, minimizing population deviations, is the same thing as rule number one. One person, one vote. Same thing. Um, so their second priority for the Alabama State Legislature is compliance with the Voting Rights Act, which is the same thing as rule two. So right off the bat, we're on the same page. First two are rules. Then they say, in addition to those two things, they're interested in contiguous geography. Contiguous means that it needs, you can't have a district that's half of it's over here and half of it's over here. Um, no islands can exist. A district has to connect to itself. It can be shaped like a barbell, but it can't be have two separate areas. Um, it needs to be reasonably compact or they'd like it to be reasonably compact, which means that when possible, we want districts that are shaped like circles or squares rather than districts that are shaped like octopuses. So relatively contiguous. Reasonably, relatively contiguous means not, not separate polka dots. Compact means more like a circle rather than, or a square rather than octopus. We want to avoid county splitting. Fascinating Alabama history there. Ask me sometime when we have more time. Um, and then the sixth thing, avoiding contests between incumbents. So they don't want to redraw lines in a way that makes two incumbents run against each other for this for the seat. So if at all possible, they're going to protect incumbents. They're also not going to push. So that means they're not going to push an incumbent into a different district. Make sense? Uh, I, I do have a question there. Yeah. Have they? Have they done that in the past, though, if it's someone in the opposite party? Well, these are guidelines. OK. OK, thank so you. So there are times when they would violate them. They certainly violate county splitting all the time. Um, reasonably compact. Our districts don't look like circles or squares. They often look like octopuses. Um, so they do violate these things sometimes, but they tell themselves these are what they're aiming for. And then last and least at the bottom of their list is communities of interest. That is you, what you want. What we the people want is the lowest priority on their list. 
keeping people together who think of themselves as a community. That's the lowest thing on the list. Lower, less important to them than protecting incumbents. And if we have time, we'll come back and talk a little bit about um, unwarranted retrogression. That's a, another can of worms. Okay, so how does it actually work? So generally speaking, maps are drawn by consultants. They're not drawn by your city council member. They're not drawn by your state legislature uh, or your member of the state legislature. Um, they're drawn by a consultant who is hired by either the, the government itself hires a consultant or the parties, very often the parties, hire a consultant to come up with maps. Um, then those maps are proposed by legislatures. So it's in the same way that any bill becomes a law, right? Like it has to come out of committee. There's a redistricting committee and that committee proposes a map as a, as a bill. If they, if everyone on the committee agrees to it, then it goes to the general body for approval. It has to be approved by the house and the Senate and signed by the governor in order to become our new official maps. So the people who are on the committee have extraordinary power. No map that they don't like is gonna get through committee. And then it has to pass. So the majority of incumbents have to vote for the map, for the new map. So you, you're never gonna pass a map that is not good for most incumbents. Um, we'll say more about that. Uh, they may or may not hold a public hearing about the new maps. Um, it's not required by law that they hold a public hearing, um, but Alabama has a, has a history, a pattern of holding public hearings. They're gonna hold public hearings this year. They've already been scheduled. They're happening at community colleges. I can send you the list of dates and times. Uh, and, uh, but the problem with the public hearing is that people often don't know what to say at a public hearing because people don't know how to tell whether a map is good or how to express what they want out of a map. And very often you're doing public hearings before you're getting, before you're seeing what the new map is gonna look like. So if you get to actually see, you know, map A, map B, and map C, you could probably say what your preferred one would be. But if you're not given any options to respond to, it's really hard at a public hearing to know how to communicate what you want for your community. Um, so what ends up happening is that legislators approve the plan. They approve the map. There's very little dissent usually. And if there is, it's along party lines. So that's how it tends to work. And what do you think goes wrong? Why don't we end up with fabulous maps at the end of this process? Well, it is uh, for several reasons. Um, one, we don't know enough or we don't feel like we know enough. So uh, as citizens, we are concerned that we don't know how to speak to these maps. And so we say nothing. So that lack of citizen engagement um, allows the people who are drawing the maps to do whatever they want um, and to feel like we don't care what they do with those maps. So we've got to find a solution to that problem. Um, you do know enough. You do enough. You're a member of your community. You know enough to engage on maps. I'll help you. I'll help you. Okay, secondly is what I call the make your own dinner principle. So I don't know how it works at your house. But in my house, if you don't like what I'm making, you can make your own dinner. Thank you very much. So uh, if I put in all the effort to go grocery shopping and produce a meal, it, you can't come to the dinner table and say you don't like it. It's too late, too late at that point. And I think the same thing happens with our legislators, whether we're talking state legislators or city council or county commission, they put in the work and effort to come up with a map and then we show up at a public hearing at the last minute maybe and say, yeah, we don't like it. And they feel like, well, it's too late now. Too late to draw a new map. We, don't, we can't hire the consultant to start from scratch again. It's too late. So we need to get involved earlier in the process so that we are part of deciding what we're buying at the grocery store, 
and what kind of what kind of food is going to be on that menu. And the third problem fundamentally is incumbents. I'm not mad at incumbents. God love you if you're a city councilor, county commissioner. It's not their fault. Um, but by human nature, they're going to want re-election more than they want to do what's best for the community. So, because they're going to see themselves as what's best for the community. It, it's sort of wild for us to ask incumbents to draw themselves out of a job. None of us would draw ourselves out of a job. Um, so, but we sh just shouldn't put incumbents in that position if you ask me. Okay, so an example of the incumbent problem from your backyard. Um, so uh, as you, you might recall, um, Jackie Reed, oh, here we go. Jackie Reed had run against Richard Showers um, for city council uh uh at least once before and she wanted to run against him again and uh the city council proposed a map a new map back in 2011 that cut jackie reed out of that district so that she couldn't challenge councilman showers she complained but ultimately the map was passed along party lines and represent councilman showers didn't have uh, have to deal with a challenger because he drew the map to cut her house out of the district. Uh, Tabitha, she just switched gears and ran against that city councilman. Well, there you go. Perennially. But sometimes it doesn't work that way. I'd love her. <laughs> But this happens. It's absolutely true that incumbents will cut challengers out of their districts. That does happen. All right. Okay. So gerrymandering. Hey, um, yeah. Tavis, I've got a question. Um, I'm Barbara, hey, and Barbara. Um, and I'm probably not thinking thinking right uh, or or doing if then too much. But um, if she did get cut out, did she have different people than that she was running against in her yeah, but she could still run but let's say she was a democrat running against a rep like and showers was a republican she wants to unseat a republican but if showers moved her into a district already held by a democrat then the battle is between two democrats and he's safe I don't know. Good question. Benita is asking, was that the same cycle they cut Edmonton Heights out of AAMU? Anyone know? I don't remember either, Benita. Yeah. When she, when the Jackie that, Reed thing that was sounds about, like it could have been because it was 10, it would have it would have only happened 10 years ago, and that's when the showers thing happened. So most likely. Yeah, she was in College Park neighborhood. And it was all about whether the line would run along Holmes Avenue or Jordan Lane. And so a distinction that's that subtle can make a big difference in terms of who's able to run. Okay, so gerrymandering. This is the fun stuff. This is the fun, evil game we get to learn. So gerrymandering is when you manipulate the boundaries of a district to favor one group over another. So we often think of gerrymandering as like weirdly shaped districts, but it doesn't have to be a weird shape. Um, what makes gerrymandering gerrymandering is if it favors one group of people over another. If one group of people benefit and another group does not. Um, the term itself comes from a political cartoon in the Boston Gazette in 1812. Um, you might notice that just above my head, uh, on, the, on the wall behind me, is the original political cartoon from 1812. I'm that much of a nerd for redistricting. Um, so, so right here above me, I don't know if you can see it, but it, this shape looks kind of like a salamander. 
but it's also got like monster wings, maybe. So the salamander part of it is where the mander comes from. And the governor at the time who approved this wild looking map was Elbridge Gerry. Elbridge Gerry, I should say. He was the governor of Massachusetts at the time. He later became vice president of the US. Um, and uh, so the political cartoonists called this a Gary Mander, as in Elbridge Gary Salamander, a Gary Mander. Now, over time, we stopped calling it a Gary Mander and started calling it a gerrymander. Um, yay for the flexibility of the English language. Uh, but it doesn't have to be shaped like a mythical beast in order to be gerrymandering. What's really important is that a something is being accomplished, something political is being accomplished by shaping the district in a particular way. Okay. All right. So there are five types of gerrymandering. There are actually many types of gerrymandering, but I'm just going to talk about five. Um, the first type of gerrymandering is partisan gerrymandering. This is when um, a particular party is favored over another. So say, for example, that you lived in a state that was 60% Republican and 40% Democrat, imagine. You would expect that 60% of the legislature would be Republican and 40% would be Democrat. If instead you had 85% of the legislature was Republican and 15% of the legislature was Democrat, that would be almost certainly an example of partisan gerrymandering. The population itself does not justify the distribution of political power. That's partisan gerrymandering, favoring one party over the other. Second type of gerrymandering, bipartisan gerrymandering. Bipartisan, everything bipartisan is good. That's what we're used to hearing, but no, bipartisan gerrymandering is also a problem. So bipartisan gerrymandering is about the incumbents favoring themselves over challengers. So let's say that Cindy and I are uh, both city council members and uh, we have districts that are right next to each other. And uh, Cindy is a Democrat and I am a Republican. So last election cycle, Cindy won her seat, but with only like 51% of the vote. It was really close and Cindy had to spend a lot of money to win that seat. And I also won my seat, but I also won by a slim margin, 51%. I had to spend a lot of money against this Democrat who was challenging me. It was a huge pain. So Cindy and I get started talking about this and how much better life would be if neither of us had such a difficult race next time. So we agree that I'm gonna push, we're gonna redraw the line to push that democratic neighborhood that I have. We're gonna push that over into Cindy's district. And we're gonna push a Republican neighborhood into my district. Now I'm gonna win next time with 60% and Cindy's gonna win next time with 60%. But no harm, no foul, right? I mean, Cindy and I already held those seats. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is Cindy and I are not as accountable to our constituents when we're not worried about reelection. So bipartisan gerrymandering is when both parties benefit, but it's only the incumbents. They're making their seats safer for themselves and making districts less competitive. Gerrymandering can also be done uh, along economic lines. So districts can be drawn in such a way that it is always the wealthy people in the district who are making the decisions, or more often, at least, it's the wealthy people who are making decisions rather than poor folks. And poor folks end up with less representation than their uh, population demographics uh, would otherwise give them. We also have prison and campus gerrymandering. So this is when, um, this is a, a setup that favors towns that have a prison or campus in them. Um, because what it does is, um, you know, you will recall that we count how many people sleep in each district. 
regardless of where they live and vote, we count how many people sleep there. So if your town has a campus or a prison, you've got a whole bunch of people who sleep there, but don't identify as being from that place. So they vote somewhere else if they vote at all, but they're counted in your population. So um, towns or cities that have significant prison populations or campus populations often get more political power than their actual voting population uh, would earn them. That is called prison gerrymandering or campus gerrymandering. And last but not least, we have racial gerrymandering, which favors white people over one or more racial minority groups. Why is this one unlike the others? Anyone know? What makes racial illegal. gerrymandering different? It's illegal. It's illegal. Yes. All of the other types are 100% legal. There is no rule against partisan gerrymandering or bipartisan gerrymandering or economic gerrymandering or campus or prison gerrymandering. Those are all legal. Only racial gerrymandering is illegal. Now, states can make laws against these other things, but at the federal level, the only thing that the federal government will protect us against is racial gerrymandering. Okay, so how do we actually do it? You gotta know how to gerrymander in order to see it when it's happening. So here, there are sort of two key ways that we talk about um, cracking and packing. So in both of these examples, we've got a community where 16 of the 36 members of the community are minorities. So 44% of the circles here are filled in, 44% are minority. Um, so how many seats would you expect a, a, a minority to control when that minority is 44% of the population? Out of four seats, four city council seats, you might expect them to have two. They're almost half of the population. That's what we would probably expect to see. But if here in the cracking example, you'll see those lines were drawn in such a way that in every single district, the minority population is four, four voters, and the majority population is five, which means that in every single district, the majority is going to be able to get what it wants and the minority population will not. So four out of four seats go to the majority, zero go to the minority. Aw, snap. In the packing example, same community, but the lines are drawn differently this time. Uh, so as many minorities as possible are packed into one district. So we've got one district, the one there in the middle, that has nine minority members, 100% minority. In that district, the minority population is going to pick their preferred candidate. Great. But in all of the other three districts, the minority population is so small that the minority population isn't even going to have an influence in the election. So the minority population gets one out of four seats in the packing example. So uh, these two tools, these two nasty tricks can be used in combination with each other. And that's happening in Alabama and we can show you um, show you on a map. Y'all all able to see this? It's an important visual to get. Cheryl is asking, would the Federal Voting Rights Act make those other forms of gerrymandering illegal? So, so the federal, um, the Voting Rights Act that's being considered right now, um, it would uh, get rid of um, the, the way that congressional seats are determined right now is by the state legislature. So Alabama state legislature will determine the district lines for our seven congressional seats. It would take that power away from them 
and instead make it a part of a um, redistricting commission that would be less partisan, hopefully not partisan, uh, and hopefully not engaging in those other forms of gerrymandering. But because it's federal legislation, it would only affect congressional district maps. It would not have any effect on city council maps, county commission maps, or state legislature maps. So as much as I'm all for the Voting Rights Act, um, it, would not, it would not solve all of these more local problems. Okay. Yeah, good question, Shondalyn. Yeah, I'm a little skeptical. So Shondalyn asked who would appoint the commissioners if there was a bipartisan commission in charge of drawing maps. I'm not clear on the details um, of how that would work. Oh man, so many good things to talk about. Bonita, maybe we'll come back to that. All right, let me keep let me keep cranking and we got so much time. All right, so how bad can things get with gerrymandering? Answer, pretty bad, pretty darn bad. So in 2000, so gerrymandering has been going on since the beginning, right? Like people have been trying to cheat via maps for a very long time. We saw that the, the uh, gerrymander political cartoon came about in 1812. It's been going on a long time. But in 2008, and both parties do it, but in 2008, the Republican Party took it to a whole new level and they launched this initiative called Red Map because what they recognized um, was that if you control, if the Republican Party controlled the state legislatures, then the Republican Party could control the seats in Congress and so by controlling certain state legislatures, they would, they would guarantee themselves control over Congress. And it's a whole lot easier to win, a whole lot cheaper to win state legislative races than it is to win congressional races, right? Like mine was a cheap congressional race and I spent half a million. State ledge races are way less than that. You know, they, or they usually are less than that. So what they did was they went to donors and said, instead of giving money to congressional races, give money to us to win state houses. And if we control the legislature, then we can guarantee that we control Congress. And that's what they did. So even when millions more voters were voting for Democrats than for Republicans for Congress, still Congress was controlled by Republicans because seats were gerrymandered to ensure, using that partisan gerrymandering, to ensure that even in a state that's 40% Democrat, like Alabama, only one of the seven congressional seats would go to a Democrat. And if you can make sure that only one out of seven goes to a Democrat, even in a state with 40% Democrats, you're good to go. You can control Congress without having to win most of the votes. And that is what they did. So uh, the Center for American Progress um, published a report. They believe it's 59 seats in the US House of Representatives that um, would have otherwise gone a different direction. So 59 seats is enough to swing, to swing Congress. Um, and that was in, in 2012, 2014, and 2016. It was 59. 59 politicians that would otherwise not have been elected, but were able to win anyway. So it's serious business, serious consequences um, from gerrymandering. Okay, so what can we do about it? So in my dream world, we would have a bipartisan redistricting commission uh, that would do that would draw lines based on uh, demographics, actually care about things like contiguous and compact, um, actually try and keep counties together, try and keep communities of interest together, um, not violate, you know, kind of what seems like common sense boundaries in a community. But in order to do that, we would need a, an amendment to the state constitution. 
And in order to get amendment to the state constitution, we would need a ballot initiative. And in order to get a ballot initiative, we have to get approval from the state legislature. Well, there's no way the state legislature is going to approve a ballot amendment that would take away their power to control Congress. No way. Now, in states where ballot initiatives can be accomplished via, um, via petition, several states have been successful. And in every single state where they have gotten a ballot initiative for a bipartisan redistricting commission, it has passed. In every single state where it's made it to the ballot, the people have voted for it. Because everybody gets this. Everybody gets that gerrymandering is dumb and not good for democracy. Um, but in Alabama, we're not going to get on the on the ballot until we convince, until we have, I don't know, <laughs> till we convince incumbents that they want to give up that power. So that's a bummer. If you want to hear a success story, go read about Michigan. They have had an amazing, uh, an amazing successful campaign. And this year will be the first year that they have a bipartisan redistricting commission. Yay for them. Okay, so if we can't do that, dream deferred, um, what we can do is we can advocate for a more inclusive and engaging process that actually listens to community input and um, values having competitive districts. I think that should be a top value for all of us. Uh, we can also attend public hearings on maps. And the one I'm going to advocate for the strongest is we need to submit alternative maps. We need to, we can't wait until dinner's on the table and then say we don't like it. We need to offer to cook. And if we offer to cook, it becomes a whole lot harder for them to ignore us. If we submit a map and say, why not this? Why not this map that we drew? Now they have to explain why their gerrymandered map, why they're gonna vote for their gerrymandered map over our map. So I think drawing that alternative map is critical and the courts agree. So um, last uh, census in 2011, Alabama drew district lines and uh, the NAACP and the ADC sued and uh, went to court um, saying this was an example of racial gerrymandering, that these districts had been packed. Minority voters were packed into to districts, um, which meant that yes, minorities controlled those districts, but had no other power in the rest of the state. And uh, so they sued. The judge came back and said, I'm willing to listen. Alabama legislature, do you think you could have done better? And the Alabama legislature said, no, no, sir. We did our very best. We're so sorry. We just, we did our very best to make it a good district, but it, black people live near each other. So there's nothing we could do about it. And the judge said, if you, NAACP and ADC, if you can draw maps, alternative maps that do a better job with minority representation than what the state legislature did, then I will rule in your favor. And they did. They went back and drew maps and they won changes to six seats, six Senate seats and nine House seats, I think it was, across the state. Um, so having those alternative maps is key to victory, whether we're talking about winning up front, which is what I vote for, or whether you're talking about winning via a court case. The problem with the court case is that it takes so long. So we didn't get those changes made until 2015. That's that's halfway through the sense, halfway through the 10 year period, halfway through the decade. Tavis, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, the judge, uh, do you know who he was or what his background was? I I would think he's a Republican judge. So uh, any any uh, uh, that, description of this judge? Um, I can show I can send you the article about it. Um, but it was a federal it was federal court. So I don't remember. If, if I may, I believe the judge, if I remember right, was Judge Karen Baldry. 
she's a senior North Alabama federal district judge and she's still on the bench today. If, if I remember, I know she was initially taking the case and uh, I believe she was the one that made the final ruling if I remember correctly. What was her last name again, Karen? Valerie is Karen, K-A-R-O-N. Valerie, B-O-W-D-R-E, I believe. Thank you. I believe that's correct. I, I know she was initially assigned the case and I believe she carried it through the end, if, if I'm correct. Thanks, Gary. Okay, so if you have a million dollars, you can also sue after the maps come out. I just don't have a million dollars. So I'm advocating for cheaper options. And if we can get it up front, if we can make sure they do a better map up front, then we don't have to wait five years for a case to work its way through the courts. So I think whatever we can get done before the maps are finalized is for the best. Okay, so what would you do? Here's how it would work. You would, I would recommend, my recommendation is that you evaluate your current county commission and city council map, asking these important questions about those maps. Then when you see where their biggest problems are and the biggest opportunities for change are, you pick a map to focus on, you start drawing new maps and you advocate on behalf of your map. Again, if you're offering to cook dinner, it's gonna be hard for them to ignore you. Timeline on this. So the census is big time delayed this year. Uh, so normally we would get apportionment data uh, in as of December, we would have gotten it December 31st, 2020. We didn't get it then, we got it April 30th. So we found out April 30th that we get to keep our seven seats. That's great. But all we found out then was how many people live in Alabama. We didn't find out like where they live in Alabama. So that data just came out last week. Um, the redistricting data, which is the more detailed demographic data down to the census block. So what we got so far is in an older format, older data format, um, but you can already get started, um, but there'll be even more data available as of September 30th, maybe a little sooner, they can get it done sooner. Um, and that data, you don't have to go like searching for that data. The data will be dumped into a mapping tool, um, into ma several different mapping tools, Maptitude, Days Redistricting app, District R, there's a whole bunch of them and some of them are free. So Dave's redistricting app is the one I'm gonna show you. It's a free tool for drawing your own maps and it already has 2020 census data populated in it. So the other really critical thing that happened with timeline here is because everything is delayed because the census was delayed, thanks COVID. Um, we're not gonna, normally we would have a map, like a final map, um, by like fall, uh, like September. But this time we're not gonna have a final map in September. We're only getting the data in September. So the final map won't come out until December, maybe February, it's very delayed. And here's why that's a problem. So in 2022, in 2022 all the state legislative seats are up for re-election. All the congressional seats are up for re-election. If you are thinking about running for the state house, for the state senate, or for congress, you don't know what district you live in. You might think you know what district you live in, but it might change. The only people who know for sure what district they live in are the incumbents who have been promised that they will not be kicked out of their district. But if you are thinking about running against an incumbent and you raised your hand and announced, I'm ready to start running, it is entirely possible that the incumbent would cut you out of that district. If you don't announce that you're running, the incumbent has a huge head start on fundraising, campaigning, et cetera. So, we are likely going to have to push out the qualifying date. Um, usually qualifying uh, happens in January. 
And we're probably gonna have to push that qualifying date out later because people won't even know what district they live in in January. Uh, you may be planning to cover this, but I'll point out that uh, candidates also don't know. And if a candidate brings up the fact that they're going to run and they're not an incumbent, um, they, they realize that they stand a chance that they'll get gerrymandered out of their district. Is that not a Yeah, risk? exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you stand up now and say something, you might get districted out. You might be redistricted out of that out of that district so that they don't have to fight you as a challenger. And I believe state law says that uh, qualifying has to close, I believe it's 90 days before the um, primary and the primary is on May 24th. So yeah. it's not a, lot of, not a lot of wiggle room there. No, so there's gonna be a special session in the fall um, for the state legislature to gather and make these decisions and they may have to, depending on how long it's taking, they may have to push the primary date, they may have to push the qualifying date, obviously trying not to do those things, um, but it's just a rush, a mad rush at this point to the end. Now, that's only for Congress and for State House and State Senate. If you're interested in City Council or County Commission, they're running on a different timeline. So, I don't know when they're gonna draw their maps. You need to talk to your local county commission or city council to find out what timeline they're planning to use for making these decisions about new maps. But there is no state law that says new maps must be done by a particular date. So we don't know um, when that will be. In many city councils, it's the city manager who's responsible for proposing a map. So the city manager who's a staff member would propose a map. They might be working with a consultant. They might not. Uh, they propose a map and then the city council votes on it. And if the city council can't agree on a map, then the one that the city manager proposed will be approved by default. They get six months to fight about it before it becomes the new map. Yeah. yeah, are you feeling a little bit angry, a little anxious, but also motivated? That's what I'm going for in today's presentation. Good, good. Okay, so let's try it. Let's practice by evaluating the Alabama congressional map. We're gonna do it just because it's big um, and easier to look at, uh, but I hope you'll do the same activity with your city council and county commission maps. And we can take a look at those too if there's time. Um, and the questions we're gonna ask, first off, are the districts evenly sized? Because if they're not evenly sized, that is a violation of rule number? One. One, yes. So uh, they will definitely have to change. If they're not evenly sized, and they probably won't be, then they have to change. Um, and you wanna see if district one is 10,000 people too many and district two is 10,000 people too few, then you know in what direction that line is probably moving. Um, so uh, you can kind of plan ahead that way. Um, second thing we're gonna look at is, is there evidence of racial gerrymandering? Because that would violate rule number two. Um, and it's definitely a reason um, to demand that the map change. Third, it's not illegal, but we can look for evidence of partisan gerrymandering. Um, Democracy does better when there are competitive districts. So I think we should all be rooting for more competitive districts. We can look for evidence of bipartisan gerrymandering. Yeah, that's the competitive districts part. And we can look to see if district lines are crossing sort of like standard boundaries that we think of. Like in Montgomery, whether you live north or south of 85 is a big distinction in terms of your identity as a Montgomeryite. Presumably in your community, there are also kind of natural lines that exist. And if you see a district line that is crossing that standard accepted community line, um, that's a reason for concern. Um, people are probably gonna be confused about why they live in a different district than somebody who lives on the same side of the line as they do. Okay, let's try it. Thanks, Rod. Rod put in the in the chat a uh, the timeline for Huntsville City Council 
doing their redistricting. Okay. okay, welcome to Dave's redistricting app. It's lovely, it's free, I highly recommend. Um, so come right here to davesredistricting.org. You click on Alabama and it gives you the congressional map, the state senate map and the state house map right at your fingertips, free. So helpful. Um, and then there are also additional maps you can get to if you wanna look and see what other people are drawing. So someone has managed to make a very proportional map, a very competitive map. These are all congressional maps. So you can kind of play and learn that way. Um, and you can also draw your own map. And I will show you, I have drawn a Huntsville City Council map and a Madison County Commission map for you to get started um, if you don't already have those. But let's take a look at the congressional map. Takes a second to load here. Ooh, Rod's already, oh, Rod. That reminds me, I have seen some of your maps here in DRA because there's a feature where you can see if someone else has drawn a similar map and I have seen your name come up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, so here is our seven district map. I'm going to turn on our district lines and our district labels so you can see those numbers. I don't know if you can see well enough. Uh, there we go. Um, FYI, you can also put on a background map. And if you turn on the background map and zoom in, you can start seeing um, roads, cities, lakes, airports, all that good stuff. So when you're looking to draw a map, you can, you can look at details there. Okay. So we are going to look first at whether the population is evenly distributed. Is rule number one being violated with this map right here? And the easiest way to do that, I think, is to go to statistics. Lovely statistics button. And it calculates all these statistics for you. It shows you for district one, that there are 726,000 people there. District two, 693,000 people. So how similar, do they have to be exactly the same population size? Anyone know what the rule is? So generally speaking, um, for congressional maps, they need to be less than 1% difference in size. We're talking about 700,000 people. Surely you can get close to exactly the same size districts. So the expectation is that there be less than 1% difference um, and to get as close as possible to zero difference in the size of the districts. For state house and state Senate maps, um, Alabama state legislature says 5% they can be up to 5% different from one another. Um, for city council and county commission maps, districts can be up to 10% different from one another in terms of their total population. So Dave's redistricting is calculating for me um, how much population deviation there is. And you'll see it's highlighting all of this in gray to indicate too much, too much population deviation. So these, this, Congressional map will have to be drawn, redrawn because the population deviation is unacceptable. So we know our congressional maps are gonna change. It's required by rule number one. Um, which district is going to get bigger? Probably. District. Geographically. Mm -hmm. Oh, and in terms About of people. seven. Yeah. So we saw significant population decline in District 7, which is the Black Belt. So this rural area here, um, this is Terry Sewell's congressional district, saw the most 
uh, reduction in population size. Uh, and so this district is going to have to get a little bit larger. It's gonna have to um, take up some more people, which usually means taking up more space. Okay, so that was question number one. Uh, did we, are the districts evenly sized? And the answer is no. Next question, is there evidence of racial gerrymandering? How do you tell? Look at the numbers. Yes, so we can go back to statistics and look there. We can also uh, look at demographics. So I'm gonna take off the map colors and I'm gonna instead have you looking at the uh, minority population. So uh, minority population is shaded. The higher the percent of the population that is minority, the darker the color. So you can see where, let me do my district lines labels. You can see where the population of minorities lives in Alabama. So in the cities, Huntsville, Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, also in the black belts more broadly. So now using your eyes, is racial gerrymandering happening? The bottleneck of number two is absolutely remarkable, right? Yeah, this one? Yeah. <laughs> this is absolutely meaningless unless there is a, a, a determination to separate voters according to some characteristics, right? Paolo, do you know where I live? You have black people on the left and on the right and nothing in the middle, right? Yes. You know where I live? is right here in the neck. Yeah. So, and I'm the, I'm the, you know, I most successful challenger for district two in the last 10 years. I have every expectation that I could be pushed out of my district. Absolutely, yeah. Because I'm so close to the edge. It wouldn't be hard for them to move that line one mile and take me out. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> So uh, this District 7 almost, almost takes up all the minority, or a vast majority of minorities. It reaches up to the Black population in Birmingham and cuts it almost exactly. It reaches over to the west side of Montgomery, the blackest, the highest density Black population in Montgomery and takes that. And it reaches down towards Mobile and sure. takes the black population there. This is a perfect textbook example of packing. Absolutely. This is how packing is done right here. You take as many minorities as possible and pack them into a single district. Absolutely. So that these minorities don't have as much power. District six, if it included Birmingham, if it included the black population in Birmingham, District 6 would be competitive. Sure. But it doesn't. If District 5 included all of the Black folks who live in the north part of the state, it would be more competitive. But this population is being cracked into two pieces. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then down here, if this Black Belt region was all in one district together, Sure. It would be a significant voting block, but instead you see that this line between District 2 and District 3 cuts directly through this Black community. So that half of those folks are in District 2 and half are in District 3, and therefore neither district has a significant minority population. Sure. Okay, so let's look at the numbers. In terms of minority representation, uh, statewide, the state is 34% minority. And we see that there are there is one district that is 66% minority and none of the other districts get above 38. That's packing. 
and cracking. How about partisan gerrymandering? Right here in these columns right here, we see that although the Democrats in the state make up 40% of the population, they get one out of seven seats. How about bipartisan gerrymandering? The fact that there are no competitive districts. There are six districts that are safely Republican and one district that is safely Democrat. No district in the state is competitive. That is bipartisan gerrymandering. Tabitha, uh, yeah. <clears throat> could you pull could you pull one of the maps back up just for a second of North Alabama District Five? Yeah. Congressional. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. We'd be kind of naive to assume that they they're planning all this stuff at the right time, like when the data comes out but they kind of already know what they're going to do, right? I assume so. I mean, they've got a consultant, the same one that they used in 2010. The, um, the fact that North Alabama has grown so much and with Huntsville's growth also came growth in Limestone County. East Limestone is a lot of these folks that have moved into the area. Um, and Athens is, is, um, uh, or it's, a, it's an urban area, so to speak. Lauderdale, uh, Florence is an urban area, so to speak. It houses a college. Um, what we think they might do is to take Lauderdale and Limestone, both to the left there, away from CD5 and add Jackson and all of DeKalb, both of which are very red, very rural making it even harder for us to do anything that would be anything similar to um, winning an election. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's funny right now. I feel like all, all of the other districts in the state are like competing and pleading to please like, we could have a second minority minor, ma, majority minority district in this state. Absolutely. The population is present. It could be done. And who, where would that be? Where would you get to when you look at this map? And I feel like it's, it's funny. Everyone that I've, I've been talking to folks all over the state and everyone wants to be that second minority majority district. Of course we do. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's an alternative map proposed at the statewide level. I know there will be alternative mm. map proposed at the statewide level. Let me back up and say that. The crowd scholars are gonna be putting together an alternative map. Um, my worry, however, about statewide maps is if y'all create a map that turns district five into a majority minority district or a competitive district, that means that district one probably can't be, or district four probably can't be. So how do you build consensus statewide around a map where inevitably there are gonna be winners and losers? So I'm a little discouraged about that, um, but I think at the local level, we have a lot more potential to get something done, to propose alternative maps. Um, I do wanna show, so in Alabama State Senate, what it's like there. Um, so here in the Alabama State Senate, um, you will see that so if a, I'm looking at these two columns, the partisan lean columns, Democrat and Republican. Um, so there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight safely Democratic seats. 
eight safely Democratic Senate seats in Alabama. There are two that are competitive, District 2 and District 7. And all the rest are safely Republican. Twenty-five districts that are safely Republican, eight that are safely Democrat, and two that are competitive. Only two out of 35 seats are competitive. That to me is a big problem. Same thing at the House level. Out of 105 districts, Come on, DRA. While that's loading, uh, we're going to go a little over. What time do you think, Tabitha? Seven fifteen ish, or depends yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I can talk about this all night. So <laughs> you have to kind of rein me in. I'm sorry. Well, many, many of us could listen to you at least half the night. So. Um, yeah, so let me just let me wrap up by saying if you are interested in this project and you want to look more closely at the Huntsville City Council map, um, at the Madison County map, if you want to be involved in those attempts at a statewide map for state legislature, um, I'm happy to connect you to resources. Um, I'm doing some Dave's tutoring for people who are interested. So if you want to learn how to draw your own maps, I would say you can learn in an hour, no problem. Um, and then, you know, you're having a great, I think it's great nerdy fun to draw maps and see what's possible. You know, can you have a city council that looks the way you want it to look? Um, so if you're interested in those things, um, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to help. Um, and as Bonita mentioned, the crowd fellows are also available. Um, they're working on that statewide map, um, and they may also be able to help you with, um, with learning tools like Dave's. Um, League of Women Voters is also doing some of this work. NAACP is doing some of this work. Um, it's all one big happy family. Um, we have lots of like coalition meetings where we talk about what's going on. So, um, you know, uh, if we have groups, Bonnie is asking. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what the crowd fellows like, how they're supposed to prioritize their work. So I can't 100% answer that question, but um, you can go to them first. I won't be offended. You can come to me first. They won't be offended. We're all on the same, we're all on the same team here. Um, any other questions for Tabitha? This has been, I mean, it's so exciting. And yeah, maybe we should set up a class on Dave's cool app here. Uh, we've got a training group in, in Madison County who might actually want to um, set you up to do this training for a select group of people. If you can ask a last question. Can you show us again the districts of the state Senate? Mm -hmm. As the map? Yeah. It seems to me that this map is much less, uh, um, let's say, obscene than the one for the US House, Federal House. So that could be taken as a, a canvas, an example, a matrix to redesign the house, federal house districts. And saying, you know, if the state Senate goes like this, why don't we just regroup some of the Senate districts to make a federal house district? And that should solve those problems that you pointed out so well before so that uh, at least uh, two or three federal house districts 
become competitive or even change color. Mm -hmm. And without, uh, you know, and just taking the example from the state Senate, which is uh, accepted by all the majority in the state. That was my point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't love the state Senate map. No, uh, neither do I, but I mean, it's much, it's less obscene than the other one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's less obscene than the House too. In terms of statistics, the, the Senate, you know, um, to have eight of 35 seats lean Democratic is not as crazy as in the, um, in the House where it's 27 out of 105 yeah. that are Democratic um, and only four out of 105 districts that are competitive at the House level. So we run to put, to perhaps put too fine a point on it. We run candidates and we want to believe that one more phone bank, one more postcard campaign, one more door knocking is going to make the difference. But unless you're in one of these four house districts that is competitive, it probably doesn't matter how many phone calls you make. Yes. If we continue to let redistricting happen, candidates are banging their heads against a steel wall except for in these four house districts and two Senate districts. That's six whole seats in the whole state that are competitive. And then the majority of the action is happening in the primaries. So primaries become very important because whoever wins the primary is going to win the seat. Um, but I don't wanna see Democrats running against Democrats if we, or Republicans running against Republicans, um, I would rather see a real race, a real competitive uh, race along those okay. standard party lines. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank um, you all. If anyone wants to stay and ask questions, you can, but good night. Be well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tabitha. This is always very, very interesting and informative. Um, folks, if you want to save the chat, there's some resources in there you don't want to lose. Uh, one, I put the um, Huntsville City Council uh, forums in there, the schedule of them and the location and time. So yeah, you I cannot to, copy uh, the, the schedule. Can you send it to us over any other? You can you can copy it. Hit those little three dots in the lower right hand corner of the chat, yes, and I it'll do. let you save it. I did copy, indeed. And okay. I will, I will send you links to some things, um, the guidelines for redistricting, the members of the state's uh, redistricting committee. Mm -hmm. Oh, I opened the wrong one there. Um, really helpful. Yeah. And if you will, I think I can pull a list of everyone who was here, or at least who signed up. So I would be happy to to mail all that out, all right. Tabitha, what you send me. Wonderful, yep, and I'll send my slides as well. And I just ask if you use them that you cite me or hometown as the source. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, and let me know if you know someone else or another group that wants to do this, have this conversation. Um, there, are, If I'm not available, there are lots of other people in the state doing trainings too. Cindy? Yes, ma'am. This is Freya. Um, will the whole presentation be available? Because sometimes there were comments about things in the slides that would be helpful. Um, I, I did record, but I, I paused the record while we were just waiting around getting ready. So I missed a little bit of it, the front end. But you have the majority. Huh? You have the majority of it. I have the vast majority of it. And with the slides, you'll be able to tell exactly what we missed. And it wasn't too much at all. Right. And okay. we do plan to put this on our YouTube channel, but you're going to have to need, you're going to need the link to be able to find it because we don't want the world to know what we know. Right. <laughs> That's why I don't let that little blue map out of my hands. <laughs> so... Yeah, this was this was very good, very informative. Um, Amazing. 
so much to cover. I'm sorry. I feel like I talk a million miles an hour, but. There we go. We're all together again. I would just like to say thank you so much because to, to you, Cindy, for setting this up and for our uh, presenter, because it is so discouraging at times just to think that mm -hmm. there's nothing we can do and, you know, that we have no real tools. And this was great. Well, I, do, I don't want y'all to feel like it's a lost cause in the whole, in, in Madison County. In Madison County, we do have some potential. I'm gonna show y'all the map for just a second, but I'm not the blue map. And I'm gonna tell you that there are pre, three precincts that are still pink. All the rest have gone blue, anywhere from five points to 20 points. Wow. This is between 2016 and 2020. And of course, there's two more years in between that and the next election. The districts that are pink, that means that it either didn't change or it went towards the Republicans, is, is the concentration of our, our Black voters. So even that is not disconcerting for us. All right, y'all ready? I'm only going to leave this up here for a couple seconds and do not do a screen capture. I'll kill you. <laughs> Hold on a second. I just want you to be encouraged by this. I just you won't let me. Here we go. See that? We are we are not in terrible shape in Madison County, but we're going to have to work for it. They're changing the state laws that probably won't get challenged fast enough or well enough to be able to affect the 22 election. Um, they're going to do everything they can to redistrict things so that we can't, that these gains are slowed as much as they can be slowed by the next election. And they'll do that with redistricting. We have candidates who are running, who are ready to run, who would love to be able to announce their candidacy, but they can't because they're afraid of being gerrymandered out. Y'all, who remembers Dennis Kucinich? He was a... Um, U.S. representative in Ohio. He uh, was a wonderful public servant, crazy guy, but he, his district got turned into that barbell <laughs> that, that Tabitha's talking about. And it was impossible. They took most of his district away from him, stretched it along a road to a whole different district where the people there wouldn't vote for him anyway. So he was voted out of office for that reason. Same thing with um, Tabitha, maybe you can help me. Uh, her name's right on the tip of my tongue, but she was the se state senator from Florence area, Lauderdale County. And her, uh, her district was gerrymandered such that she still had Florence, was but it, it came all the way over to Huntsville. Was it I Huntsville? remember that. Yeah, it was, I thought about that. That was Tammy time. Irons. Tammy Irons. Thank you. Thank you. I was thinking about that the whole time this program was going on. <laughs> yeah, she didn't run again. She knew she couldn't win. So, right. Hmm. And she was an excellent public servant, Democrat, but very smart. Democrat and very smart, I should say, and. You know, it's just really sad to lose her. And of course, we, we have a Republican senator from over there now. But this is why elections are important, especially midterms. And even though they can't do anything about it this time, if we, if we move a little bit, um, we're building our base, we're building the bench. So, can I, can I just point out? Are you going to show us something? Just, else? This, just this one yeah. little stat, which is so Madison County is 51 46. So almost evenly split between mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans. And there are three safely Republican seats, one safely Democrat seat by a lot. That's, That's that pink seat. area. And then there's two that are kind of competitive, but they lean Republican. That doesn't, this, these numbers here don't back up this distribution of seats. We would expect to see competitive seats 
or we'd expect to see an even number of Democratic strongholds as Republican strongholds. This is this is some partisan gerrymandering right here. Mm-hmm. They, you know, this district is so packed to make sure that the other districts aren't competitive or don't go Democrat. Yeah. So I don't want y'all to get discouraged. I think we can make some headway in Madison County this next election. We just have to work for it. And and the term retrogression is a good one to know. So retrogression is when a district like six um, becomes less dominated by a minority group. So Alabama says they want to avoid retrogression which would mean that this 87 or that this 79.36 number can't go down. They want to avoid lowering this number any. But if you don't lower it, and they say that's because they're pr- protecting minorities by protecting this number being so high. Yeah. But if you don't lower this number, then none of the other seats have any minority power. So they're basically put reframing packing as a, a, a nice, a kindness they are doing to the minority community. <laughs> and so when you hear, you know, that that's what they say in their, in their priority guidelines um, that they wanna avoid retrogression. Oh, that's the wrong one. They say it's part of the, as part of compliance with the Voting Rights Act, they want to avoid unwarranted retrogression or dilution of racial or ethnic minority voting strength, which is their way of saying they're not going to let District 7, Terry Sewell's district, become any less minority. And they're putting that under the header of compliance with the Voting Rights Act. even though the only way to get a second minority majority district is to reduce the percent of Terry Sewell's district that is minority. So I just think that's a sly little trick that the legislature has pulled off. Yeah. Well, I have to ask if um, you're going to run again. Well, as I said, <laughs> there's like no way to win the way these districts are drawn. I, I still think it's worth running. Don't get me wrong. But like the kind of race that I ran, I quit my job for a year. I raised half a million dollars. Like I can't, I can't do that. My family can't afford to do that every two years with me not winning (laughs) right (laughs) so I might run for something local even if I can't win um just to keep up the pressure you know that's how we hold people accountable is by running against them um but all of my all of my local seats are held by democrats and so is it appropriate to primary another democrat to hold them accountable are all democrats the same it's a very hard, it's a very hard discussion. Um, in general, I don't want to primary a Democrat, but also if there are only four competitive seats in the state, what choice do I have? Right. Isn't the real elect, if the real election is happening in the primary, then let's have a real election with competition, not just let the incumbents keep it for life. Right, right now, once you're in, you're in for life for as long as you want it because it's very unlikely anyone's going to challenge. And where do you live? I live in Montgomery. Montgomery, okay. Uh This may seem heartless, cruel, uh, unkind, but the people that you're referring to um, are there for life and, and, you know, not to question their effectivity and their positions, but if they're not very effective and they're not seeking to go further and make room for somebody else to come behind them, then, you know, if the party's going to survive, sometimes you've got to do stuff like that. That's my heartless 
<laughs> cruel position. I, I don't think it's heartless. I think I think competition is good for all of us. I think that's how we hold our representatives accountable. If they're not going to be held accountable in a general election, then we have to hold them accountable in a primary and say we've got two Democrats, both of whom are promising you to be a great representative. We're not at that point choosing based on electability. Oftentimes in a primary, we're choosing who we think can we think we're choosing who can win against a Republican. But these are not competitive seats. So we're not choosing who can win against a Republican. We're choosing who will fight for us most effectively. And it might not be the incumbent. It might be, but it might not be. So I think it's fine to, I know it's a hot topic in the Democratic Party right now, but I think it's fine to primary a fellow Democrat because there aren't, that's where the real election is happening. Transparency has to be something that we all accountability has to be something that we all root for, I think. So, but it's, it's hard. I get that it's, that's a tough thing. We like to just be supportive. I want to support all of our, this is me taking off my bipartisan hat. I want to support all the Democrats. I do. But. <laughs> all right. I'm going to get out of here. Okay. Call, call me if you need anything. I'll put my email address in the in the chat if anybody wants to contact me directly. Thank you. Thank you, Tabitha, very much. And again, if anybody would like to save the chat because of the resources in it, at the bottom of your chat window, there's three little buttons on the right hand side. Tap those and it'll let you save the chat. I think that's it, right? No, they changed it. I can do it that oh, way. Oh, no, it's the little page, the little page that's beside the smiley face. Kevin, can we get the county maps on the computer? Mine's the little dots. Yeah, yeah, mine is too. Yeah. Okay, all right. I, I think I'm in the wrong place, but glad y'all know how to do that and you're not depending on me for instruction. <laughs> Tabitha, thank you very, very, very much. No problem. And I will send you, I'm going to send you a bunch of resources, including links to um, the Madison County Commission map, so you Good. can see this stuff and a link to the Huntsville City Council map. Are you going to send those to us, Cindy? Yeah, I'll forward them on to the list from who, uh, okay. folks who signed up for this. Okay. Thank All righty. You so Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye.